Welcome to the Reschooled Podcast, the show that discusses all the things that schools may have missed with your hosts, AJ Kuti and Jason Gordon. Hey everybody, we are back. We are the Reschooled Podcast, the show that discusses the things that schools may not have prepared you for. As always, I'm AJ, your host, uh, and sitting across from me, your other host, Jason. Jason, how you doing? Crushing it, AJ. Exactly I what you, you should not say during an interview. Yes, don't don't say that. Just don't. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> well, as as Jason just alluded to, we are going to be talking about interviews today, and actually, we're going to break this up into sub categories or sub topics here uh, on the interviews because we feel like this is such a big piece, and so this is really part one of the interview sub series, and we're going to be talking about the process of the sub series. In the next episode, we're going to be really talking about the substance of the, the, the interviews. So like the questions that's asked, how to answer those properly, uh, those kind of things. But this one, we're just going to be looking at kind of the, the broad look of, of interviews. Uh, so you excited about that? Absolutely. This, again, I teach so much of this career development stuff in my professionalism course that, you know, getting it out there for the wider audience and just having a discussion with somebody about it like this. Yeah, I'm excited. I love interviews. Like this was the one thing that I was the most absolute confident about myself going into was an interview. If I could just get my foot in the door, I felt pretty confident that I can make the best impression uh, within the interview more so than I could with my resume or my cover letter. Uh, It doesn't mean I always got the job, but I just felt more comfortable with it. And I was really relaxed in an interview versus, you know, somebody reading a resume. Yeah, I mean, so, that goes to the heart of what the whole resume cover letter stuff is, is just to get you that opportunity. And some people do so much work on the resume and cover letter and then get to the interview and don't do the work that they need to do, right? They don't prepare ahead of time and all that stuff. And that's why we're here today, the process stuff, right? We got to got to tell people what to think about, what to do, what to bring, all that kind of stuff. So, But before we do, got to remind everybody, our website, check us out, reschool.com. That's reschool with a D, not an E-D. Um, listen to our old episodes, see the topics we've covered, but most importantly, our contact form, reach out to us, let us know about the things you want to hear about. Cause we want to talk about them here on the episode. If it's shorter type question stuff, we'll address it during our mailbag stuff on our YouTube channel, which also our social media handles, right? YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, all those good things. Uh, check us out there. See what we're, you know, see what we're up to, that type of thing. Stay up to date with what we're putting out, right? We put out notifications when we drop new shows. Lastly, your favorite podcasting apps, right? Make sure you're, you know, downloading our new episodes, get notifications when we drop new episodes. And if you like what we're doing, give us that five-star rating. We really appreciate it. That'd that help us out a good deal. Well, let's get into the quick question of the day. Uh, we're going to kind of follow a trend with the one that we did on the resume episode, and that is, what is the funniest thing that you've ever heard during an interview? <laughs> or maybe you said it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've never said much that funny uh, during an interview. But, uh, you know, I would honestly say the funniest thing I've seen comes from TV shows. Oh, yeah. Right? You know, that type of thing. I, I'm reminded of that episode, that movie Kingpin, right? The bowling movie with Woody Harrelson. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where, I love that show. Yeah, that he's movie. interviewing it. He's like, you know, and I, you know, lost my hand and, you know, then, and then, of course, you know, pff, the 90s, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like. That just, explains it all. Yeah, that just explains <laughs> it all, right? Uh, tight scenario. You know, real life. Probably I, the funniest thing I've ever heard is what I said on the way in. Like, you know, just that I, oh yeah, oh yeah I'm crushing it. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that is not a professional thing to say during an interview, right? Unless I don't know. I guess the audience, right? You you gauge your audience. The audience where this person said it, that was not the audience to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that was that's that's mine because the audience was not the place to say this. But I have a buddy of mine who was sitting through an interview. He was actually part of the conducting party that was doing the interview for the, for the candidates. And they asked the candidates about their leadership experience. Can, can you give us an, a time where you exuded leadership uh, in a role and where it succeeded? And a lot of them, and this is, like I said, this is very professional. This is very um, uh, stringent. This is not something that's really, you know, you don't play a whole lot about this, <laughs> but he told me one guy said that, yeah, he, he has experience in leadership. He once led his command unit into battle and the and won the battle on a video game. It was like Call of Duty. 
And he's like, wow. he led his group into the battle and successfully navigated blah, 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 blah. And my buddy said he was just sitting in the corner trying not to laugh, <laughs> had like tears in his eyes trying so hard not to laugh <laughs> because that is not something that needed to be said in this interview. Yeah. Sharing your Call of Duty success is not what's going <laughs> to win you the job in most scenarios, right? Um, no, it didn't. I don't think it, I don't think it did at all. Um, <laughs> and all I can think of is, man, you, but you gotta, you gotta give the guy credit. He had the stones to say something like that in this interview. <laughs> and he was thinking creatively enough of when. Exactly. I, I mean, it and, actually kind of <laughs> kind of a little embarrassing in the fact like this is the best you got in terms exactly. of yeah, yeah. where you showed leadership, right? That's yeah. that's all the leadership you got. <laughs> right. Most people, I think, just cuss at each other and like talk smack yeah. during, uh, you know, Call of Duty uh, games. But Well, that's what I told my buddy. I said, I think. I think I would almost look at this and go, you know what? I don't have any leadership experience before I'd have said that one. <laughs> oh. yeah. I, I, I love, you know, parody stuff about interviews and stuff in there everywhere. I'm also reminded of that one where um, from Goodwill Hunting, where Ben Affleck is posing oh, yeah. as Matt Damon, right? The main character. Mm-hmm. And he's in that interview. I actually use that video during my negotiations lecture. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> because, you know, the part where he's, you know, he, he basically cons them into giving them him money as a retainer, uh-huh. right? It's, it's just amazing, right? But again, not what you want to do as an interview. No, don't do that. Yeah, no, yeah. no, definitely don't do that. There, you know, that's one of those things is with resumes, there are certain things that you can say, don't do that for this field. And there are certain things that you say, but you can, you can accept it. Like the creativity side, there are certain industries where creativity is needed. And so using a different format or using kind of an outlier uh, way of looking at resumes is justifiable. When it comes to interviews, it seems like there's, it's pretty just cut and dry. It, it, there's, you don't want to be very creative. <laughs> you know, in an, in a different episode, we're going to talk to all about what goes on during the interview, like the substance of it, yep. right? The things you talk about, all that good stuff. But for now, today, we need to focus on getting people ready for it, the procedure to expect in the interview, that type of thing, because that's a whole monster unto itself, Right how you prepare, what to expect, all that good stuff. Well, let's get into it. Uh, okay. Let's let's start with our first main question about interviews, and we're going to still follow the same thing we've been doing with the cover letter and the resume, is what is the true purpose of an interview? We've talked about that from the cover letter and the resume side, but what is the true purpose of going through the interview process? Well, so I have to reiterate this, that you know the whole re- the hiring process is people hiring people. Okay? Now, all this about, you know, putting in your resume and cover letter and it going through electronic sorters and stuff like that to make sure you have the right keywords so to see that you're even qualified before a human being ever sees it and going through recruiters who nominate you or recommend you before anybody again ever sees your real resume and stuff like that. All that is, is you know, to say that ultimately, if you do get the interview, right, you are among a select group that that company says, one, meets the minimum qualifications for the job or among everybody who meets the minimum qualifications, you look the best of that group. But when it comes to the inter- the interview, one, they're wanting to make certain that's accurate, that you do have the requisite amount of knowledge, skills, ability, that type of thing to do the job. But ne- really, as much as anything, they're trying to see whether you will fit in the organization. People have different personalities. People have different approaches to things, different uh, mentalities, things like that. And individuals and organizations alike have a culture, right? They have a disposition. There's actually, you know, you, you'll hear all these terms that are career development terms like the, the airport test. And if you've ever heard the airport test, it's basically the idea that uh, you're asking yourself when you're interviewing somebody, If I were stuck in an airport with this person for a couple hours and we couldn't go anywhere, right? There's nothing to do in the airport there except for just sit there beside each other. Would you feel comfortable? Would you like or at least not be appalled by having to sit there and talk to this person for a couple of hours? So basically what it's saying is how well does this person in the sociological sense, how well do they fit with you? And that's what people look for, right? We have this tendency to want to be understood and to understand other people, right? And that relates to our interests, values, and beliefs. So think about it in terms of that. When you're going in there for an interview, yes, you're going to have to confirm 
right? Demonstrate and show everything that you put on your resume is accurate and their assessment of it is true. Sometimes their assessment of it is off. They're not giving you enough credit or sometimes they're giving you too much credit and that can eliminate you if they need you to be at that level and you're not, right? So to make certain you meet whatever your resume is putting out there, but getting to that point where you can demonstrate that you are a good fit with that organizational culture And that normally starts with showing that you are a fit with the person on the other side of the table. Okay. But that being said, right, that being said, that's all, again, substance. And we're going to deal with that later in a uh, separate podcast episode, just because it's so much we have to talk about, right? We'll talk about how you answer questions and all that good, good stuff, the questions you can expect, how you, you know, but now like procedurally, what you're going to do on the way in is, is, is where we're aiming. Yeah, I look at the interview as the almost the evaluation of the qualitative things that you put on your resume because the quantitative is quantitative. Mm-hmm. But when you say again, if 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 you're somebody that puts this that like you work well with others, you're very personable, you do this, this is their way to evaluate if that really is true, and mm-hmm. also obviously get some of their questions answered. But if you say you're a very personal person and you're not very personable in the interview then you're pretty much going to get written off right away because they're, that's what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. It's it's one of those things that you, you're having to show. To me, the worst thing you can do in, a, in, a, in an interview is not be yourself. You're trying to be somebody who you're not because that's going to come across as fake. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing you can, unless you're an, you know, an, an, an Oscar-winning actor or actress, that's going to come across as fake. Mm-hmm. And they're wanting to see if the real you is going to sit well with the, the company. Um, and in both, again, qual- quantitative, which is on the resume, but qualitative. Are you going to jive well with the, the group that you're going to work with? Are you going to be a good leader? Those kind of things. And so this is your way to put that, you know, on exhibit to show that you are this this person that works well with others. You are this person that is a good leader. You are this person that is very eloquent. You speak very eloquently. Um, you're not lying, those kind of things. So, well, let's, uh, that's, well, let's yeah, jump let's, into let's, some specifics then about how you get to that point, how you get ready, how you prepare yourself, what to expect, all that kind of stuff so that you are ready to put your best foot forward like that. Okay. So give me, give me one thing we need to pay attention to. All right. So let's start with, you have just been offered an interview. What next? Okay. First, you need to um, it, learn something about the company. Now, I know you researched the company to put in your resume and cover letter, right? So you know a little bit about the company. But if you're going to go in there for an interview, you need to really understand that company. You're telling that company you want to be a part of them, and you're going to interview with a department. Not only do you need to understand who's in that, uh, that department, kind of how it functions, how it's structured in the organization, but over the entire organization. Right. Who's the CEO? Who's the president? Who's the division leader? Who's that type of thing? Right. What space do they occupy in the market? If it's a big company, there's a lot to know there. If it's a small business, obviously, that's less important. Right. Or less public information. But you can do everything from a simple Google search to businesses that do that in the area type scenario just to learn what the competitive playing field looks like. Right. Type scenario. Knowing things about the industry will help you answer questions so well in the future. Okay. So researching the employer, researching the industry, right? Looking for anything of substance that can be uh, fodder for you to discuss during the interview process. Okay. So that's number yeah, one. Your, your preparations prior to the interview is, is probably almost as important as the interview itself. If you go in there dry with no information whatsoever, uh, you're going to be caught off guard. And that's one of the big things that they're probably going to be looking for is to see how prepared are you. So the homework prior to the interview is, is really, really important. And like you were talking about, the, the background information on the, on the company, that way you can hold your own when it comes to a conversation about the company. You can also show how maybe potentially you can help the company because that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to find somebody that's going to add value to their company. Mm-hmm. And so that preparation is, is key. I, I would say along the same lines, as the preparation for the interview is the preparation of the items that you should really bring to the interview. 
there are certain items, at least uh, in my opinion, and I think in yours as well, that there are certain things that you really, you don't want to come empty handed. That's right. the worst thing you can do. I would always bring copies of your cover letter and your resume just in case. There's there's a good chance that they're going to have those in front of them, but there's not a, a better situation where they go, you know, I don't have your resume in front of me, and you go, don't worry about it. I have it right here. Here's my cover letter and my resume. It looks, it makes you look very prepared. It makes you look, um, in a sense, it, it makes, it comes off to them as you're ready for anything. You're prepared from the very beginning. If anything comes up, you know how to handle it. And that's just one of the good things to have uh, in that in that situation. Also, if you have business cards, business cards are a beautiful thing just to hand it to them very quickly because it gives, again it gives it that professional look. Uh, so those are the two things that just come to my mind really quickly in terms of the items that you need to bring. Can you think of any other ones? Sure. Um, you know, first ask yourself how are you going to carry your resume and cover letter in there first. Have them printed one page each, right? Stapled together so they're together. Have multiple copies because, because what if like at large companies, we'll talk about this, but they have these phased interviews where normally you interview with a group, usually three or four people, and then you interview after that, usually later in the same day uh, with a kind of like the manager or somebody who's leading out that group or whatever individually. So have at least four or five copies of your resume and cover letter together in there with you. Print out everything uh, that was sent to you ahead of time and evaluate whether you need to bring it. Sometimes the most important thing to bring is the procedural things of park here, show up here at this time, that type of thing. I've heard and seen it happen before where somebody showed up for an interview and they said, well, your interview was an hour ago. You're late. And the, the person says, uh, no, not at all. Look, here is the email I received with the instructions. Here's the time from the individual saying that this is when I was to show up and when I was. And they were like, oh, you're right. Rather than simply saying, oh, I'm sorry. No, I thought it was this time and going backwards, try to dig through or whatever. One, they would probably still interview you even if you missed it. But to show that you were the one who was prepared enough so that's just one of those fail safe. It's an, an insurance policy. Plus two, if it's a little bit complicated, I've been to s some parking decks before where getting from the parking deck into the place where you interview or finding that office was not terribly easy. So once again, having those procedures so you can reference them in place, that's, that's another thing, right? How are you going to bring this stuff with you? Have some kind of portfolio, right? Some kind of like leather or faux leather or whatever bound type thing that you can close or snap or zip up together. Maybe also a, a tote bag, right? Type thing that looks professional uh, in nature, you know, something like that. You're, you're obviously, we're going to talk about how you dress here in a minute, right? And part of the bag you bring is part of the overall appearance and dress process. But if you start there and say, look, I got my little portfolio. I've got a pen. I've got a pad. I've got my business cards. Don't bring business cards from your other employer, right? No. Bring, bring business cards that present you as a professional in this field, right? Your name, your qualifications, titles, uh, it, qualifications, certifications, that type of thing, but also a marketing professional, professional in marketing analytics, right? That type of thing where it describes and has your contact information on it. So these personalized um, business cards, right? Have those in there with the information, the procedural information, your resume, uh, cover letter stapled together. And here's a big one too. Now I've already told you, you need to research the company. You need to write some of those big things down that you need to remember and make flashcards or little yes. cheat sheets. Have those things with you. You can study those when you're sitting in the parking lot in your car waiting to go inside because you showed up early and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. When you're uh, sitting outside waiting to see the person, right, that you're going to be interviewing with, you are not to be playing on your phone. That is a big no-no, all right? They think you're playing Minecraft, right? It just looks <laughs> negative, <laughs> okay? Minecraft of all games, huh? Yeah, and if you don't know, all right, if you don't know, the interview starts the minute you get there. OK, mm -hmm. everybody who sees you as part of the interview process, I got a couple of stories I'm going to fill you in on uh, in a few minutes uh, that that are to that point. OK, so you, you're going to be using your time wisely. Have information on those cards, like everything from people's names, right? Their positions, things about the company that you can go through and remind yourself, because when you get nervous, 
you'll forget some of those things. You'll forget to bring them up, right? And these are your conversation points. This is what's going to keep the conversation flowing. It's going to keep things sounding natural and things like that. So I'll switch back over to you. I got a couple more, AJ, but back to you. Let's let's get to the dress. I think the dress okay. is a really big, is a very important one because you can argue a couple different things. I mean, I could see arguments on different things, uh, you know, whether to, to wear a tie or whether not to, you know, you wear a suit, but no tie mm-hmm. or whether to wear a jacket, but you, or, or not wear a jacket, but you still have a tie. There's a, there's a bunch of different things. And I'm saying this from the male side. Um, I, I don't have a lot of experience on the female dressing side, but um, what are some things that we can give our listeners in terms of how to dress for uh, the interview? So I'm going to go broad. I'm not going to sure. give you specific examples. I'm going to tell you this. YouTube is your best friend. It's got so much instructional stuff out there about what looks professional, what qualifies as business attire, what qualifies as business casual, what qualifies as casual but still looks acceptable for men and women, right? It's going to tell you, you know, you know, that dark gray or black or blue tends to be your more serious professional colors, okay? A a highly conservative firm, uh, you're not going to wear a, a multicolored shirt, Right. Even if you're wearing a tie and a a very formal suit. Right. You would just it would be white or like a pale blue or something like that. And that's as far as you'd want to go. Right. There's this old saying about IBM. Right. IBM was traditionally a very conservative uh, type of company. Right. Same way with like Coca-Cola here in Atlanta. Okay, Very conservative type of company. You're you're not going to uh, wear your, you know, new fashionable suit right? That doesn't look like you're going to wear the more traditional business attire. So I can't wear the dumb and dumber blue tux? No, or tux? no. You got to stay oh. away from that, man. You know, with the cane and the top hat. Yes. Yeah. Yes, right. You can't do that. So oh man, YouTube's your best friend. It's going to give you all the specifics you need to understand the, the you know, levels of professional. And they'll talk about color patterns. They'll call, talk about combination of shirt with tie and stuff like that. Uh, you know, shoes uh, with, you know, what type of shoes to women, you know, not over a certain height of heel, types of heels, men having a hard heel, not a soft sole, just all kinds of stuff like that. It's interesting we're talking about this and I'm, 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 I'm going to bring this up now, hoping I can speak it into existence, uh, if that makes sense. Because uh, as, as I've said before, I'm, I'm going through my doctoral program right now and one of my cohort members is in the area of fashion. And she has actually done research on fashion and business attire versus business casual attire. And I'm hoping I can bring her up on on an episode here in the near future to get her opinions on this kind of stuff. Because I do think, you know, what is that that defining point of business to business casual? What are certain things that we can use? And and having her opinion, I think, would be a, a lot of fun to have her on and, and get her opinion on, on those kind of things. So I'm, I'm excited about that one. I'm hoping that we can work that one out. Oh, that's a great that, that that that'd be a great person to have on there. Somebody who's done the research and sees the numbers behind oh, why yeah. it matters. Yep. Timing. Okay. When do we get there? When do we? You know, I've got an interview at one o'clock. What is my timing going to look like? It's going to depend. Here in Atlanta, if you're going downtown, you need to allow lots of extra time. Okay. I mean, one. Do some reconnaissance if you can. If it's not one of those scenarios where you're flown out to the location and you're renting a car and all that kind of good stuff, which you're still going to have to plan backwards, uh, but do some recon. Drive it during the same conditions on a different day to make certain that this is how long it takes. This is where I'll be parking, that type of thing. So once you've done that, back it up. Make sure you arrive to the parking lot. So you show up for the actual interview 10 minutes early. That is standard. 10 minutes before your interview time is when you arrive. No more than 15 because that looks, that starts to make it inconvenient for the other person and starts to make it a little more difficult on you to stay engaged and and things like that, to stay on, as we say. Uh, But from there, so you've got an interview at one o'clock, you're arriving at 1245. You do the math backwards as to how long it takes you to get there, park, et cetera. Allow an extra 20 minutes. OK, now I already told you to print out the all the correspondence from them. So if something happens, like if you're on your way and you're stuck in traffic because of a wreck and you're running late, you need to know who to call 
And you need to call well in advance. You call 30 minutes in advance, 45 minutes in advance and say, look, I'm running 30 minutes behind and it's because of this traffic. They don't think you overslept, right? Yeah. They, yeah. It doesn't look bad for you. It looks like, oh, this person's well prepared. They are already on the way. Traffic is bad. They're telling us ahead of time. You know, there's still 45 minutes or an hour. They can still move interviews around. They might be able to interview the next person ahead of you. That that type of thing. They can adjust their schedule and you don't inconvenience them. So I know what you're thinking. Well, if I'm baking that much time into it and I've got to arrive that early, how can I arrive, you know, 30, 45 minutes before my interview and it not look awkward. Well, don't walk into the office at that time. You can go into the parking deck or go to the parking lot or, you know, identify the place where you're going to drive up to and then sit at the gas station right down the road or park in the back of the parking lot. So, you know, you're not obvious to everybody and sitting up front or park at the back of the parking garage. That's when you break out your material that you took notes on and start studying, start reviewing that stuff, start practicing the interview questions that we'll talk about in a different episode. Start doing these things so that you're in the mindset, you're ready, you feel confident walking in there so you can walk in there thinking about the, the, the secondary things like making eye contact, standing up straight, smiling, looking confident, being engaging, right? Remembering people's names, that type of thing, and not focusing so hard on like, okay, what's, you know, uh, what are the, what are the four things I'm going to say about my past that show leadership, right? Yep. That type of thing. That stuff, you've already got it cold, so you can focus on more of that procedural stuff in, in the moment. Yeah, if, and if you're going for a position in the South where in the summer it's 100 degrees, you do not want to be running to your interview because you're a little late. And then by the time you get there, you're sweating. Oh, yeah. Good point. Ex not not a good look for you. <laughs> no. Your hair is all frazzled, right? You're, you're well, sweating. Well, if I had any, but yes. You, you can't take your jacket off at any point, no exactly. matter what, even if they invite you to. And by the way, anything they invite you to to make you more comfortable, do it. Because, yes. again, that's a, a invitation towards informality, and that means you, you're establishing more of that fit, right? You're mimicking them. But you got huge pit stains, right, running around for sweat <laughs> stains for, because you, you you were so nervous or, or running up to the office. That's not going to be a good look, right? So being relaxed, taking your time, it's just going to make everything easier for you. Well, that's a perfect segue to the next point. And this is the point that I really – I focus a lot of my time and, and focus on is the mannerisms mm. in the interview. Like to me, the mannerisms are these little things that you can do within the interview or right before the interview or even right after the interview that doesn't give you, they're not going to hire you because of these, but they could, they, they may give you a, a, a leg up on certain things, but they can easily discourage the person that is trying to hire you or looking into you uh, doing the interview. They can easily discourage them from hiring you mm -hmm. because it just doesn't mesh well with them. Like to me, when you go into, and this is a hard thing for a lot of people to, to come to when it comes to interviews. Interviews, the best interviews are the ones where both parties are comfortable. Mm -hmm. If you're relaxed and you're comfortable Things go easier. Things uh, you're able to uh, relax the tensions, ease the tensions, and it makes it more inviting. Uh, and it gives you all the reasons why a company should should hire you, because they're not looking for you to be professional 100 percent of the time. They're looking for you to do what you need to do and create rapport with the people who are going to be under you or next to you or even higher than you. And so the best way to create that rapport is to be comfortable. Uh, and understand what's going on. So the mannerisms are are huge to me. Now right. you mentioned a couple of them. You know, eye contact, mm -hmm. maintaining eye contact. That shows confidence. Um, you want to sh when you shake hands, shake a firm hand. Don't do the whole limp noodle thing. Right. You you that's that's actually one of the first things that they will write you off on quicker than anything else. Is oh. if you come in with not a strong handshake, you can pretty much write it. You, you can much cancel that job. Yeah, it ain't a, gonna happen. A, a dead fish is a huge turnoff for so many people, right? You throw that that limp hand out there and people shake and yeah. it, it just yeah, it just and you know, there's a fine line in all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. You hear this stuff and we don't want to create the wrong impression. When we say confidence, we're not talking about arrogance. Yes, right. Confidence exactly. in yourself, confidence enough to to walk in with a big smile on your face and feeling comfortable and saying, 
you know, hello, my name's so-and-so, right? That type of thing. It just, it projects an air of, oh, this person is somebody that you wouldn't mind being around. Just that confidence attracts other people in that way. Arrogance does the exact opposite. It alienates people, right? So all of these things, you know, there's a fine line between congeniality and silliness, okay? Right? Basically being smiling, you know, being a little bit personable in how you address somebody type scenario is wonderful. But making awkward jokes or being too silly about how you act, you know, type scenario, like you do a little walk dance shuffle. Like I love watching Shit's Creek, right? I don't know if you watch that episode, but there's a guy in there, mechanic Bob, right? And Bob, everywhere he goes, he does this little funny like walk, right? With this big goofy grin on his face, but it's kind of funny. He kind of throws his arms out and it's this, I don't know, kind of shuffling, dancey walk type thing that's kind of signature of his on the show. <laughs> well, that's that's gone too far, right? That's not bit. the smiling big and the congeniality and seeing something uh, very nice. That's gone overboard to annoying silliness, right? Yeah. So there's a fine line on all of these. You don't want to go overboard on either. So the essence of it is to practice. Yep. Practice with other people. Understand what you're going for. Understand what you're trying to achieve. Because AJ said it best. You're trying to establish a rapport, which means you're basically trying to establish that sociological fit, that understanding that you have with other people when they feel comfortable around you. Right. In that in that mannerisms category and you you creating that rapport, there is a skill that is super important. That I mean, it's not you're never going to learn this in a class. It's just it, it takes time, like much like you said, it takes practice. But there is a skill of reading the room mm-hmm. that is super important when it comes to interviews. Because I've sat in interviews where the person across from me is super professional, and I have to be. And again, I'm still staying with myself. I'm still I'm not changing who I am, but I just have to be the more professional part of myself. And so I don't. I'm not able to get that uh, comfort level for that other person down as quickly as I want. I can do it through my professional way. It just takes a little bit longer. Whereas I've had the same, you know, same company, but somebody else interviewed me in like uh, the second step or third step where that person is really relaxed. They, they themselves cut jokes. So I can tell that they're comfortable in this. And I'm not saying I cut jokes because they cut jokes, but I can relax and be a little bit calmer and try to build this personable relationship with them rather than this professional relationship with them. So a lot of times when I'm in an interview with somebody like that who is very comfort uh, driven, they're very uh, comfortable in the the interview itself. If I see that, there's a good chance I'm going to look around that person's office, assuming I'm doing the interview in their office. And I'm going to see if I can find pictures of places that they've been. So I can try to connect to them in that way. So if they go to the beach, I can bring up going to the beach. Or if they go to the mountains, I can bring up going to the mountains. Mm -hmm. And it creates this personable relationship with them that even brings the comfort level even lower. And they're more likely to see you as a good fit for the company and more likely to hire you. Well, I'm going to add on something to that as well. When I said at the very beginning that you need to do your research on the company and things, it is also possible that you can do research on the people that are going to be interviewing you especially in smaller firms, if you know who you're interviewing with, you can do that whole internet stalk them, right? Be careful about that, right? You don't want to look inappropriate, but looking at their LinkedIn profile will tell you where they went to school, what their past jobs are, things like that, where they're from potentially, right? If somebody has an open Facebook account, you can even look on there and see things about them. Do they have kids, right? What area do they live in? That type of thing. All of these things may be, what you're trying to do is identify commonalities with you or things that you can actively talk with them about. And once you identify those things, you've got fodder for conversation. Now, if you can't do any of that, right? You depend on your ability, once again, to read a person when you first meet them, their mannerisms, to mimic them, to adopt to that, to look around the room, as AJ says, reading the room, look, see what they have on the wall, right? That'll tell you where they, whether they have family, kids, whether they like certain types of art, where they went to school, what are their interests and things like that, right? Yeah, I was about to say, you can probably find their diploma on the wall. Yeah, diploma's a big one. People always put pictures around their office, you know, if it's, um, you know, when people have set offices like that, 
Um, they'll have family pictures and things like that. They'll generally have things that they're interested in, right? There'll be, uh, you know, the college football team or professional football team or professional baseball team or whatever that they're into, like a little thing there on their desk or something like that, you know. So all of these things is just information for you so that once again, you can relate to the person and start to transmit information about you, receive information about them to make you feel comfortable in the situation. Because once again, that comfort is the essence of improving communications, feeling like you fit with somebody. If they believe they understand you, they're going to believe you fit in that organization. Okay. Yep. A couple other points that I would want to put under mannerisms just to keep aware of. Uh, we don't have to go into these deep, but uh, one, uh, bad breath. You definitely don't want to go into an interview with bad breath. So I would say keep a piece of gum in your mouth until you get right into right before you get in the door, throw it in the trash. So, so um, we jumped past this when we were talking about, you know, dress and stuff because mm -hmm. we summarized everything on YouTube. But there's a whole thing in addition to dress. It's hair. It's mm -hmm. and then there's hygiene. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would say that falls into the hygiene aspect. Right. Um, you know, the hair that's thing. Actually one of the, go, that's go, actually go one of the YouTube, top right? things. What? Yeah, that's actually one of the top things that will get you not to get the job faster than anything else is, is bad breath. Yeah. So there's bad breath. There's the smell of your perfume or cologne. Overbearing, yeah. Yeah, it can be hugely dead. Having cologne or perfume on your hands, when you mm -hmm. shake hands with somebody and leaving that smell on the other person's hand, that is a huge issue. Having sweaty palms and things like that when, when you shake hands. Right. Some people can't help it, but there are things you can do to mitigate it. Right. Yep. That type of thing. Um, so uh, brushing your teeth. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. or, or making certain you've you know done the best you can in that regard to present good hygiene. OK. Uh, getting plenty of sleep ahead of time so you don't have bloodshot eyes. Um, making certain. Right. That don't do that thing, especially in the southeast of the United States. Don't slick your hair straight back. We, we have well, again. I would assume I have hair, well, so we have negative perceptions about that, guys. In the South, right? You know, that's yeah. something a little more acceptable up in the Northeast of the United States. A lot of people still do it. They put gel in their hair and slick it straight back. It's not. It's just not something we do down south that often, unless you go down to Florida, right? And it's just not well received, right? So knowing the like the etiquette stuff, right? How you appear to others um, type scenario is going to be important. Some some tangential things to that, uh, party nails, right? Having long yes, yeah. fingernails or that, that are painted like really bright or sparkly colors or worst of all, having some kind of design or something on them, right? Yep. People will discriminate against you based upon that, right? Type scenario. So, um, you know, Checking your extremities uh, in that way, right? Really big dangly earrings and things like that. Uh, once again, I'll go within that same same vein. Another one is as you're in the interview, if you can mimic the body of the person who's doing the interview, it relaxes the comfort level as well. Mm -hmm. There's been pr studies that prove like, so if that person is sitting up on the edge of their seat and you sit up on the edge of your seat, if they're tilted to the right, then you tilt to the right a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things just, just give off this, this ease of comfort. And so they're, they're more likely to become relaxed. Again, these are things that are not going to get you the interview or get you the job. These are just things that's going to help you create an environment that's going to put you in a better light. Mm -hmm. And we're rambling a little bit on this. I know there's so much stuff out there, but about, yeah. about the best we can do on this procedural side of stuff is to give you a checklist of things to think about. You're going to have to practice this on your own. You're going to have to develop what is your comfort level. Of course, you can always do the things we're talking about, doing the research and things like that. But once again, understanding what is appropriate at a given organization in terms of level of formality. Okay. Uh, understanding, uh, you know, things about, you know, expectation of how much time it should take you, all this stuff. All this stuff is things that you're going to have to prepare on. You're going to have to visit YouTube and see all the variations for what is professional attire. You're going to have to think in terms of, well, how do I make myself look the most inviting, right, possible? How do I wear my hair? What, what do I make sure about in terms of, you know, uh, conversation, uh, 
elements to have, things like that. And all of that are the procedural steps you need to do to be successful. I'll give off one more of the mannerisms. And this is just one of those things that, again, I do right before I go into an interview because it is important for me, especially the way I talk, because I, I tend to talk very quickly, is as I'm in my car sitting there waiting to go in, I think it's really important that you do both vocal and mouth exercises to go ahead and, and loosen up your, so you don't trip over your words. And so that way you're speaking clear. And also it's, you know, it's, it's sad to say this, but some people don't have a lot of experience talking while smiling. And so having that practice, because you're, you, again, you're still wanting to smile in this interview, being able to go through things and, and explain things uh, eloquently with a smile on your face is actually harder than some people think. Absolutely. And so g getting that practice is going to really help you. And like I said, you do it right before you get out of the car. So that way your mouth is, is you, the, the muscles in your mouth are stretched out and you won't trip over your words. Yeah, that's a, that's actually a huge uh, communications technique, making certain your people tend to gravitate towards people more if you have a deeper voice and the more stretched out your vocal cords are there. The, it changes the, mm -hmm. the pitch of your voice. It, it makes your voice a more soothing, deeper, calm sounding, right? We all know that, right? Once you yell a lot afterwards, your voice seems a little deeper uh, type scenario. So anyway, just taking deep breaths, doing the vocal exercise type things. But there's a lot of things like that that you're going to have to practice so hard and get in the routine of practicing. It is very difficult to continue to make eye contact with somebody. Yes. Knowing how I struggle to with that. Yeah. Knowing how to successfully have a conversation where you maintain eye contact takes practice. Right. Some people have it naturally. Right. They did it all their life type things. But so many others can't. Uh, students these days, that is something I see in them that is so difficult for them. If I make eye contact with them and start to have a conversation, they cannot look me in the eye. And that's a really difficult. Yeah difficult social thing that they're going to have to overcome if they want to relate to somebody in my generation and above, right? Yeah. Because we still expect that. Sitting up straight all the time is not that easy if you're not accustomed to doing it, right? Sitting professionally in a way where, you know, you keep, you keep your legs together, but uh, remain attentive and engaged by leaning forward a little bit. If you're not used to sitting in a chair like that, practice it, right? Walking into the room and engaging everybody, right, where you come in and you make eye contact with everyone there and you take the next step to walk towards someone and extend, extend your hand and shake their hand and then move on to the next person. Making that initial engagement, breaking with them and moving to the next person is very difficult. It is yep. a social scenario that you have to practice, right? Because I've seen people fumble through it all the time where they'll shake hands with somebody and then not even acknowledge others. And then they just rush to sit down because they're a little nervous or something, uh, you know, that type of thing. Right. Um, so I could talk about mannerisms for days yeah. because if there's just so many things that can go into an interview that's going to help you, uh, like just, just the practice of not saying, um, can help. But and that's let's, the let's most go difficult the, one of all, I believe. Oh, that's yeah, that's awful. Let's go on to the next one, though. The after interview to do list. Are there some checkpoints that you would say that you need to consider after the interview is completed? Yes, you need to practice the standing up, thanking someone for their time, looking them in the eye, shaking hands or shaking hands with the multiple people in the room, getting your stuff and leaving. Right. Having an awkward exit is will be what they remember most about the interview if you have an awkward exit. So being able to confidently stand up, thank someone, grab your, inf grab your bag, grab your information, pull your card out and say, just in case you need to directly contact me, here you go. Again, pleasure meeting you all. And then turning around and walking out, that type of thing, without tripping over the chair, without waiting for you know, to, to see what they do for, cause it'll be awkward for them if they have to shuffle you out the door or you don't pick up on the subtle cues that this is the time for you to go. Right. Yeah. Type scenario. So practicing not to make it awkward is huge. Right. And so AJ, moving on to you, you got a couple. Yeah. I would say the the after interview email, yeah. that's a big one. Follow the, the follow up email. Yeah. To, to say, you know, thank you for your time. You know, if you have any questions, I'm I'm happy to answer them. You know, if you thought of any after the interview, uh, I really appreciate your time uh, and I look forward to hopefully hearing from you in the, in the near future. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big one. And now, what would you say about 24 hours after the, the, the interview is completed, you would send that at, yes. min, uh, at max the next yeah. day. Yeah. The next day. So it, that's, that's a big one. And it just shows that you care enough to continue checking in you just to say, you know, again, thank you for your time. Uh, outside of that, you want to, again, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're putting you back on their mind, mm -hmm. uh, for that day. You're and so it's a good thing to have. Your procedure for leaving is something I left out, I got to say, as well. So when you walk out of there, there are going to be people. There's going to be the secretary or administrative assistant or somebody who's going to, you know, you, you need to acknowledge them, thank them for their time. If they're going to do validating parking or something like that to talk to them, that type of thing. If you need to make a subsequent appointment or, or interview date, whatever you need to do, but to acknowledge the people on the way out. And mm -hmm. I said I was going to tell the story earlier, but I didn't. I, I heard a story about a person coming in, right? And this was from somebody who I was doing interviews with, a candidate coming in for interview. And they were walking down the hallway to the office where to, they were to interview. And somebody was in front of them pushing a cart. And it was taking long. And just based upon the volume of people in the hallway, they couldn't walk around them very easily. And they said something rude to them. They said, could yeah. you please hurry up or move out of the way? Something like that along those lines. And it turns out the person that was pushing the cart was somebody who was very close to a member or could have just as easily been on the interviewing committee, but wasn't right. But was close with all of those people. So what did that person do? Immediately went back to the other group and told them what just happened. That person, mm -hmm. they might as well not have had an interview. Yep. They would have they never gotten off. hired. And so on the way in and on the way out, both apply. So showing cord, 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 cordiality, I guess, uh, if I'm saying Cordialness that. Cordialness. Is, is, is that cordiality? Yeah. <laughs> Remaining um, professional Cordial. on the way in and out. Very, yep. very important. I love those stories of... Uh, creative ways that people interview or get interviewed or the way they implement, you know, different things or different styles in interviews. You know, I heard one about one in uh, New York where it's the last leg of the, the interview process. So you're, you're being interviewed by the CEO and the CEO is going to take you to lunch. And so before the, the, the interview, the lunch interview, he goes to the diner to set it up to where he tells the waitress, Hey, I'm going to bring somebody here, whatever they order, just mess it up. I'll give you the tip. Don't worry about it. Just just mess it up enough that it's noticeable, but obviously not, you know, extreme. Mm -hmm. And so they go to the diner and the, the person orders it and something is wrong and they want to see it, it is all part of the interview. They want to see how you react because there's there's really three ways you can react. You can get too uh, extreme and really blow up. Well, that, that company doesn't want that. Mm hmm. Or the, the, the complete opposite extreme would be you just don't say anything at all because the company doesn't want that either. They want somebody that, that by not saying something at all, one of two things have happened. You either didn't notice it, which means you're not detail oriented, mm -hmm. or you did notice it, but you didn't stand up for it. Mm -hmm. They don't want either one of those. So what they're looking for is somebody that would, that would stand up to this, but do it in a very cordial and nice way. And that was one of their metrics when it comes to the hiring process. I, I love that. Because again, it reiterates what you said. The hiring process starts the moment you step foot. Mm -hmm. That's it. it, it everything becomes, a, 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 I guess you would say, a test in the hiring process. And so, yeah, AJ, your story is a good segue for next time. We're going to talk about formats of interview, types of interview, the pre-interview, like the yep. pre-interview screening, which is in, it, in its way, own way an interview, right? All of that stuff, the content for that. Uh, in a second episode. So make sure you tune in for that one here. We just wanted to throw it out there, get all, all this stuff on your plate to consider about the procedural elements that go into the interview. And if you practice these things, you can become very good at them and they're going to make all the difference in the world as to whether you are indeed creating opportunities for yourself. Well, this has been an amazing episode. I, I, I love talking about the stuff. I talk this stuff about the, to my students all the time. And it's such an important thing. So I've really enjoyed this one. And I can't wait for the next episode when we talk about those, the substance of the interview, because I think even that is, is more important potentially. Like that one question that we all hate is what is your, what do you find is your, your deficiency? Yeah. What big, is your biggest you know, weakness? Yeah. What is your biggest weakness? And I can't stand that question, but there is an actual way to answer it and, and a way to answer it in a yeah. positive light. And so yeah. we're going to talk about that in the next episode. 
Absolutely. Well, good. Do you have anything else to say? Yeah. Remind everybody out there. Again, we're talking about the things you care about only because you told us you care about them. So visit our website, drop us a line, let us know. We want to hear what you want to hear. We'll talk about them. That's what we do. Awesome. Well, until next time, we hope to see you there. Goodbye. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Reschooled Podcast. Be sure to head over to reschooled.com for news and other information on things we're getting into.